morning, everybody. I do believe it's Tuesday today. Last I checked. Still working on the same little hand spun piece. you can see this loom a little bit at least. Um, it would be better for me if it was tilted, but it's better for the camera if it is flat. Added a little thing in there. Um, let me see what y'all are up to. Um, <laughs> good morning, America. That's nice, Harold. Good morning, America. <clears throat> London, Pennsylvania, Cape Cod, Edinburgh. It's really fun to have <clears throat> all of you here from all over the United States and all over the world. So you really do make my day. Thank you for telling me where you're from. And even the people from Pueblo and Colorado Springs and Fort Collins um, and Sweden. Blue skies are back in Santa Fe. That's good, Sheila. Um, and good old Rio Rancho, New Mexico. Oh no, Sue, I know there were big storms through part of the country. I'm sorry about your basement. Um, Sue said she had to mop out her basement yesterday. Trees are falling on houses. Does it ever feel like the world is kind of nutso, y'all? Hi, Wendy from Boulder, right down the street. Um, New Brunswick, that's cool. I have had moments where I thought, I should move to Northern Canada. Loveland and Durango. It has been snowing in Fort Collins, although I think we may get a little sun today. Um, that's a good question, Gail. Um, Washington, good morning from Bainbridge. Portugal, hi Mandy. Um, oh, hi Brenda, I'm glad to hear from you. Brenda is in Antigua on a boat waiting to come home. So I've been watching your journey, Brenda. Um, I hope you make it back. I hope that things haven't been too crazy. It sounds like they've been crazy. Good morning from Idaho, Kansas City, a couple of you from Kansas City. Oh, Jessica's asking what kind of cotton I was spinning. I don't know. She was making a spin from the bowl. Um, I know I was real negative about spinning cotton. It just isn't. Um, eventually, I may try it again, but I don't really know, Jessica. It was some kind of cotton. And I tried it for like five minutes, so I don't really have a good baseline on how to spin cotton. Uh, yes, I know, Barbara, Canada has serious immigration restrictions. Don't worry, I'm not going to try to hike over the border quite yet. Um, you all keep your country nice and happy. Uh, bend. 
Oh yeah, Linda has a good question if anybody has an answer. Um, if anyone has recommendations on a brand of a painter's box easel, pop that in the chat. Um, for Mirax looms, 16 or 28 inch. So I like the ones that have the easel thing that slides. So if you all know of a brand, it's probably harder to shop because um, harder to get to an art supply store. So. Um, so Gail asked about Abusan versus Goblon um, weaving. And I talked, actually, Gail, if you haven't ever seen my videos about France, I talked about that. Um, there's some good examples there um, on my blog from last summer ish there's a recap post of all my little things from france but um go blonde weavers weave on upright looms like this w wait <laughs> this one that loom right there um is a go blonde here well, you can't really see it it has a bunch of stuff hanging on it but um that is an upright loom and the Goblon weavers in France. I don't actually know if you're asking particularly about French weavers, but you're asking with French terms. So the um, French weavers who weave in the Goblon style are weaving on upright looms with bobbins and the Abusan weavers are weaving on Abusan looms, which if you Google that, you'll see pictures or there's a bunch on my blog. Um, they are low warp looms, but they um, also have treadles. So both kinds of looms have treadles. And they're doing very similarly styled work. The work that I saw them doing was um, quite a bit the same. Most of the, almost all of the weavers I saw in France were using Abusan looms, so low warp looms. And they're all weaving from the back. High warp and low warp weavers are weaving from the back. And um, the Abusan weavers used cotton seine twine, which I was super happy to see. Their looms are so tight. I can't even tell you how tight. I, I was appalled. It's the kind of tight that your Mirax were, will get if you use that wrench that they send you and tighten the warp, like super, super tight. Um, so the Goblon, the Abusan weavers were on the lower loom. The wool weavers had warps break and the Abusan weavers never had warps break. So it's that is a drawback of the wool warps just aren't quite as strong. Uh, anyway, that's a little start on that and there's tons more on my blog and I'm actually still working on some stuff to put up about what I saw in France. Um, okay, Virginia Whidbey Island. Um, weaving supplies in Europe. Mandy, look at Weaver's Bazaar. Uh, they're in the UK. They have all those things you're asking about. Um, there's also a place in the UK that sells um, Mirax looms called Hand Weaver Studio, that might be right. Those of you in the UK can give, um, or those of you in Europe can give Mandy some, uh, yeah, Mandy some other suggestions. Those are the two I know though. Um, so Dorothy asked what's low warp weaving. So if you could see my looms behind me, this loom over here where the warp is vertical is high warp. And this loom over here where the warp goes this way is low warp. Thanks, Anna, um, for popping that in. Um, Kathleen's asking about where to get sign twine warp. Um, I'm 100% sure colored. She's looking for colored cotton sign twine. I'm 100% sure the Woolery has it um, in a bunch of colors, but there's a lot of other places that carry it also, so. Um, in my classes, there's lists of, in some of the classes, there's lists of where to get various yarns, but you can always ask in your online class. Okay, cool. All right. Dinah's asking the question I hate answering the most. What's um, back versus front? But this is a better question, Dinah. Which techniques are easier to weave from the back and why? Um, the two techniques that I like to weave from the back are the regular hatching that I teach in Warp and Weft and Little Looms and because it has these jump overs and it's far easier to have the yarn right in front of me and it's faster and I use it a lot in my work. And then the double weft interlock is 
far, far easier. Some people say you can't do double weft interlock from the front. Kathy Todd Hooker just explains how to do it from the front in your, her book, but um, double weft interlock is a technique they use a ton in France on the low warp Abusan looms. I saw it all over the place. Um, they're using that join all the time to make those complicated tapestries. When the colors are changing every warp or two, they're, everything is put together with double warp interlock, and that works really great from the back. Um, thank you. Um, Nan, actually, I was trying to come up with Vafstuga. So Vafstuga, Lone Star Lo um, Loom Room, the Woolery, Eugene Textile Center, all of those places have cotton seine twine, and I believe they all have the colored. The colored only, um, 12 6 is the only size that comes in colors. Everything, as far as I know, everything else is white. Um, oh, right, Anna, the Isle of Wight. Um, IST makes really beautiful bobbins if you're in Europe and you're looking for um, bobbins over there. Um, IST, I can't remember what that stands for, but I've seen their bobbins. They're lovely. Um, great, I'm so glad you all are here. I wanted to show you um, this. See if I can show you this. Okay, that's what I'm working on. I wanted to put a photo in so that you could actually see up close um, what the um, weaving is looking like. And I probably can't get all of that on one page because I needed to crop this. Hold on, I could crop it like this. Technology. So that shows you a little bit of what this actually looks like um, with the hand spun, which is so much fun. And I'm adding a little window in here. I'm not actually liking what I'm seeing that much, but um, it's all right. I wanted to do a little, let's see if I can zoom this in. I wanted to do a, a um, not really a dovetail. I'm alternating the colors around this warp because I wanted it to look like it was toothy, like this. But then I made it go over one more warp and it's a little bit fatter than I want, so. Anyway, maybe I'll do it twice. Maybe I'll do another one after this. And fix that, or maybe I'll just move on. Um, I think this is Dorothy also, um, a different Dorothy. How is carpet warp different? That is an excellent question. Cotton seam twine is cabled. So it is a warp that is plied into bundles of two, three, or four, and then those bundles are plied together again, which is called a cabled yarn. It's very, a little bit stretchy and extremely strong. The, um, for example, 12-6 cotton seine twine has um, six little, um, oh, thanks. Um, the cotton seine twine has six little, that was my helper. This is 12-12 cotton seine twine, and if you divide it up like this, it is three bundles. Can you see that? Hold on, where's the camera focusing? Okay, so it has three bundles of four. So each of these bundles has four little pieces of yarn in it. So each of these three bundles is plied one time, twisted together one time, and then all three of them are twisted together again in the opposite direction. So this is a cabled warp. The carpet warp, 8-4 carpet warp, is, I, in my opinion, it's horrible for tapestry and I wouldn't waste your time on it, but um, I know that there are actually tapestry companies that sell it for warp, so um, I'm a little opinionated about it. It's, it's four strands twisted one time, so it's not stretchy at all. It's quite loose. Um, it doesn't take abrasion well. It's made for carpets that have um, 
lots and lots of warp threads and then thick weft. And I just don't feel like it's a good material for tapestry weaving. But that is my opinion. And plenty of people use it. It comes in a lot of colors, so that's why people like it. But the cotton stain twine also comes in colors. And I just feel like it's a much better warp. Um, oh, Marilyn has uh, Yarn Barn of Kansas is another good idea. If you live in Yarn Barn of Kansas is another great um, shop. I bought my spinning wheel from them and they were so awesome. So, yes, those are all fairly small businesses and they're well worth supporting all those ones I listed. Um, please do send them your money if you need to order something. Vav Stuka, The Woolery, Eugene Textile Center, Yarn Barn of Kansas, uh, Lone Star Loom Room. The Swedish warps and the other Scandinavian warps are all quite similar. There's some really nice warps made in Finland also, or sold through Finland. I actually think most of those warps are made in Egypt, but... Um, You, they're marketed as Scandinavian. So I'm filling in that side. Um. Ah, man, good question. So this is an experiment. She wants to know what this yarn is in the middle of the window and it is this um, Weaver's Bazaar silk. So it's actually um, 30, I think it's 32, not 62. Pretty sure it's 32 silk. Um, this came from Weaver's Bazaar and it's the same thing I was using on the um, hot flash piece for the um, little eccentric outline things when I was working on that last week. I just wanted this to really stand out and let me tell you, <laughs> it's really standing out. I don't know if I like it. So this little um, window part you can see is um, here, here is what Nan is asking about. Um, so Karen is asking about four eight cotton colored yarn. Do you mean eight four? Karen, and here's my frustration is that yarn numbers are different and they're based on a system um, from guilds in Europe where every single different kind of fiber had a different um, numbering system and it goes by number of yards per pound or something weird like that. So the base number is different for every single fiber, linen, cotton, wool. Um, so the numbers um, don't line up between different kinds of fibers. And also in the U in Europe, they use, and in Canada, they use different numbers than we use in the States. So four eight could be anything. I think it's probably eight four, but um, I don't know. So I get really frustrated with the numbers because people will email me and be like, I have this and it's labeled this, what is it? And I have no idea. <laughs> so. There's a very good book out there by Liz Gibson called The Weaver's Guide to Yarn, I think. is It's called something like that. If you go to Liz's website, it's, um, that might be it, The Weaver's Guide to Yarn. Anyway, she explains that guild system and she talks about numbering systems and she's much more level-headed about the numbers of yarns than I am. But what I often say is just order some because it's the only way you're really going to know what it is. And if you're in the UK or Europe, um, your yarns are, you know, like Weaver's Bazaar names their warps like 12s and 6s, and I have no idea what that means. <laughs> so go by yards per pound 
or order some and look at how the yarn is constructed because the number doesn't tell you how the yarn is made, whether it's cabled or just plied or something else. Um, okay, anyway. Sorry, that was a little soapbox. Sorry about that. Uh, all right. This hand spun is so thin. Uh, it's a little bit thinner even than the 18 to Weaver's Bazaar. So I'm having a little trouble matching those two sizes up which means at some point I'll probably have to put an extra pass of the um, hand spun in if it's, uh, the hand spun's also irregular, but to make it match up. So like if you're weaving a shape and you're weaving up in shapes like this and one, and you're using two different yarns, and one is a little different in size, you can always fill in. Like if this were really sliding down, I could do a little tiny pass in here to build up this color again. It's not cheating. Thanks, Dorothy. It is, uh, the book I was talking about of Liz's is The Weaver's Guide to Yarn. I found it really, um, helpful because it helped me with my frustration of understanding why the yarn numbers are so weird. In the U.S., the second number in the yarn numbering system is the number of plies. So 12-6 I know has six plies in it, but when the numbers get messed up, you don't really know what they mean. Oh, that's cool. Kate says hand uh, interweave also had something in handwoven that explained what all those numbers were. I don't think I've seen that one. Thanks, Missy. Eight four and four eight are the same thing. The first number in those, so like twelve six or twenty six, the first number refers to how many um, yards per pound or that guild numbering system where. Um, Basically, it refers to how thick the individual plies are. So in that yarn I showed you that had 12 little things. Um, this is 12, 12, and whatever, the size of one of these little plies is what the 12 is referring to. And 26, this little ply would be thinner than this one. Hmm, Dory, no, this isn't eccentric at all. She's asking, is the black dovetail similar to eccentric weaving outline? Not at all. Um, eccentric outlines are horizontal and they're um, laid over a shape non-perpendicular to the warp. And this is um, not that at all. This is a completely different technique. I'm just doing a little tiny join going up the side of this. So those of you who've done more weaving will also realize right away that I'm going to have two slits here and I'm not going to be happy about it. So um, I have not in my head figured out what I'm going to do. Probably my answer is I'm going to make this little window quite short so that I don't have to sew them. This might be if I can keep the... Um, gap here from spreading, I might actually put a few stitches on the back when I take it off the loom instead of trying to stitch these really thin threads as I go, but I don't really know. You're welcome, Donald. And I might not be totally right about what the numbers mean, but I'm quite certain that the cotton stain twine number description um, is pretty correct. I had to figure that out myself due to frustration because <laughs> I had so many questions I didn't know what it was so I finally tracked down the answers. Okay so I 
probably Marlena. Marlena's asking if I could have used a bar join here. Uh, probably I wouldn't have, but only because of the size of this, that this is 12 EPI. If I had some super thin thread, maybe even thinner than sewing thread, the problem is that the sewing thread honestly isn't that much thinner than the yarn I'm already using for warp. I mean, for weft. So I feel like if I use this for a bar join, which is a join that um, just holds together slits, I feel like at this set, if I use that bar join, this sewing thread is going to show, either show or give the piece a really, um, it's gonna give it a cast. If I used white, it would really dull down this brown. Um, and it would also dull down the silk. So if I were doing this at eight ends per inch, it would be a good choice. So I'm just gonna do, my original idea, I was going to have a little hill here, but this is only four warps wide, this little green bit. And so, I don't know. I'll try to do a hill. Here, let's try it. I wonder if this could get any closer. I'm going to just make this smaller. do a little modified hill and then you saw that I got out the blue I know it's super literal a window with a green hill and a blue sky I feel like we're all behind windows right now this silk is so thin that I'm doubling it almost supposedly half the size of the 18-2. It's not quite, but it's definitely thinner than this is the 18-2 Weaver's Bazaar. This is also so thin. I almost never do this, but... Um, I did it on the bottom. I'm going to do it again here. I'm doing a lark's head knot, which I don't teach in any of my classes, but in little tiny things, sometimes um, you can start a thread. So because I doubled this blue, come on, focus. Because um, I doubled this blue, I can have a loop at one end and I can just bring that through there. And then I don't have tails there. It does... Um, if you, the way I just did it, the little loop sort of goes to the back, depending on what my shed is here. And to be honest, I'm having trouble seeing it because I need new glasses and I waited too long to go to the optometrist and now I can't go. Okay, this is a valley thread. So I can go over this. I'm going to go <laughs> I might really hate this is it do you ever do stuff like that you put stuff in and you're like oh I don't think so I in some ways wanted the contrast between the really bright silk and the really subtle hand spun but now that I see it in the weaving I'm thinking oh boy that looks like a little much Oops. Sorry. Um, great. You guys have some good options. Egyptian cotton is a good thing to look for. And sounds like I'm not the only one who. <laughs> There's a lot of things I procrastinated on and now I'm really like I haven't had my car serviced in a very long time. And now I'm like, well, 
I'm not driving it, so maybe it doesn't matter, but um, yeah. This is where we are. So anyway, I'm just filling in these little bits of silk. I suspect I will leave this. If I don't like it, I will just do another one. don't actually want them to be exactly the same height, so I might stop that blue right there. Although that's going to make a little short squatty window. Okay, maybe I'll make the blue longer. The bluer the sky, the better these days. Yes. Actually, that's true, Missy, now that you say that. 185 over 2, is that like um, for Bob and Lace? So 185 over 2 would be like, it must be like, hair. That is crazy. You're right. Um, <laughs> Dory, that's funny. Yeah, at least we have an excuse for why we can't see right now. Um, I did go to the dentists before all this happened, so there's one win, right? So I'm just building up this shape. And then obviously I'm going to bring these up the side and cover it on the top. And I'll try to work up something that's a little bigger. I think the 12 EPI is hard to see on the computer screen. Okay. So this is what I would do. If I was going to make it this tall, I'm going to pigtail this, which is just a way to trap that end. Oops. And bring it to the back. I'm not going to cut that off yet, be shorter, because some possibility I might change my mind and want to change that height of that. But there is, wow, I think that uh, this looks a little bit weird, but what are you going to do? Um, I think it looks a little weird, but what are you going to do? Yeah. So, um, you all are hanging in there. A gray for the frame is a good idea, Barb. Um, it would match really nicely with this background color. Um, oh, yeah, Dorothy, I was thinking of it looking out the window that I feel like we're sort of trapped inside and we're looking out and my neighbors are all howling at eight o'clock at night and uh, I don't know if that's a thing all over the world. I know in other places they're clapping for healthcare workers, but we don't live anywhere near. Um, it's like suburbia, so they're howling instead. It sounds like coyotes actually sometimes. Some of them are good. Um, yeah, so um, keep weaving. I will um, have a couple other things I want to work on. Oh, there is one more thing I wanted to tell you. Um, and it is this. We talked yesterday about this. So I did a little more research and... Um, this is the link for the Collingwood. The Techniques of Rug Weaving is the book we were talking about yesterday by Peter Collingwood. That's the one that I know that has all of the um, tapestry techniques and the little braid finish in it and apparently has wedge weaving stuff in it. Um, if you Google 
Um, as some of you said yesterday, if you Google the techniques of rug weaving by Peter Collingwood, probably this link will come up. It's um, that whole book you can download in a PDF. You will also find another book of his called Rug Weaving Techniques, which is a much shorter book, and that is also available in PDF. So just know that there are two different books, and if you're frustrated that one of them doesn't have the braid or the wedge weave in it, it's because you're looking at the wrong book. Um, Nora, yes, um, that happens a lot. So Nora said, I love it when you don't like something or decide to change it. Um, that I think, especially on small things for me is just part of it. Like, I'm just going to try it and see if I like it or not. Of course I have a, the more experience you have weaving, the more you know whether you're going to like something or not. Although sometimes that can trip you up because if you, um, just think in your head that I'm not gonna like it and you never try like two colors together or a particular technique, then um, you might actually, it might be something that you like and you might, um, you might learn something is where I'm going with that. Um, so yes, experimentation. The more you experiment, the better. Um, Donald, I did a uh, pigtail to tie this off. So I just took the um, weft, wrapped it around and stuck it. Oh, you can't see that. <laughs> Sorry. I took the um, blue, wrapped it out around a warp and then just um, trapped it under the weft. So it's called a pigtail. And so you bring it across. Um, I haven't, I never used it in Rio Grande weaving, so that's probably why you haven't seen it, but it's just um, ties off the end and s s um, sends it to the back. I don't think I ever once used, I didn't learn that in Rio Grande weaving, so it's not a traditional technique there, but um, it works for a lot of things. It actually helps, um, you can use it in little places where you just need one extra wrap at the end of a piece of yarn. You can use a little pigtail and it can help change this way a form looks. Oh, good, Karen. So it's not just Fort Collins that they're ha they're howling. She said they're howling there as well. Um, clapping I like. Um, I kind of make sure you have the right file. There are two books. You know, I didn't scan through, so it could be, I don't know. There might be two parts. Oh, John says there's two parts. So search a little farther. There should be a second file with the second half of the book in it. Or you got the wrong book, one or the other. Um, I don't think I had, I didn't have to set up any accounts. I just clicked that link, this little blue link right here. I just clicked that and I had the download. And this is part one, I think. Um, so it's great to see you guys. It's Tuesday. I'll be here tomorrow. Um, I'm finishing a great big project today, so I hope to be less distracted by tomorrow and to have some new weaving things to show you. So I'm excited to look at some new um, small weaving projects for the rest of the week and um, keep weaving and use that. I actually haven't even looked at the hashtag for a few days because I've been busy um, working on this book, but... Um, Use the hashtag and I will check out what y'all are doing, especially on Instagram, but I'll try to look on Twitter also um, or on Facebook, whatever. Um, yeah, that's my thought, Sarah, is that the actual book book, the Techniques of Rug Weaving has over 500 pages, so it should be big. Um, Thanks you all. It's been really fun to check in with you every day and you actually got me to do some weaving and I will, I'll probably just finish this and we'll look at it and you can tell me whether you like the silk or not. Um, have fun and um, hopefully there aren't tornadoes and storms where you are, but if there are, please stay safe and um, y'all are the best.